Well, good morning, church. Good and morning. Happy Sabbath. Barbara, Byron, and I are just delighted to be with you this morning. We wish you all a very blessed Sabbath. We are pleased that you have decided to join us virtually to study God's Word through the Sabbath School lesson. Byron, will you pray for God's blessing on this morning's study? Yes, let's bow our heads. Lord, we come to you with humble hearts, Lord. We come to you seeking your guidance, your wisdom, your discernment. Lord, we pray and ask that the Holy Spirit may descend and dwell in each and every one of us, Lord, and those teaching and those hearing that, Lord, your word may be manif made manifold and true to each and every person. Lord, the title of this, this lesson is death in a sinful world. Lord, help us to learn what the wages of sin are. They are death. Amen. Help us to learn how we can walk in your ways, Lord, that we might do what is right in your eyes. And Lord, that we might shun that which is not of your word, which is truly rebellion against you, that we may prosper in this world, Lord, and in the next with you for all eternity. We thank you, Lord, and praise your glorious name, our Father in heaven, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen, Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Byron. Thank you. This is lesson number two of uh, a new quarter, a new quarter that really is going to concentrate on death, dying, and the future hope. And um, I'm hoping that you will grasp this quarterly's message, that you will study it with all your heart, and uh, this week is no exception. I really enjoyed going through this week's study. As Byron mentioned, this week's lesson is titled Death in a Sinful World. And the memory text, the key text, is found in Romans chapter 5, verses 12. And this is how Paul puts it. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, does death spread to all men because all sin. You know, there's a, a lot that I could say about it. I'm not going to do that. But I want to really speak about this verse um, in, this, in this vein. In the verse, the Apostle Paul's main purpose seems to be to emphasize the far-reaching results um, of the work of Christ by comparing and contrasting the conse consequences of Christ's justifying act with the effect of Adam's sin. Uh, that verse... This sentence, uh, that, that very verse sentence that says, therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, that sentence. Paul begins the comparison between the effects of Adam's sin and the effects of Christ's redemption. In this verse, the main point of comparison that Paul is emphasizing is that sin and death, as a matter of principle and power, proceeds from Adam to the whole human race. Likewise, righteousness and life as a countering and, cons and, and conquering principle and power proceeds from Christ to all mankind. And that's good news for me. That's really good news for me. Here's a brief overview of this week's Sabbath School lesson. God created a perfect world without sin, without evil without violence, without insecurity, without sickness, without death. Our God is the true God of life, the source of life, and the giver of life. There is a vast contrast between the world of Genesis chapters 1 and 2, where everything is meaningful, it is beautiful, it is harmonious, loving, created in bright and joyful and light colors with uplifting melody and the world of the rest of Genesis, the other 48 chapters, in which everything good is suddenly hit by a storm of sin and consequently damaged with loving relations, ruined. The colors become dark, the music discordant, the excellent pure potential for growth and exploration comes to an old 
it is just marred by sin. Yes, in his mercy, your God and my God, our God is in search of humanity. And despite sin, God brings hope and a solution to the problem of sin and death. No philosophical system, no religion can bring a solution to death or the process of dying and restoration of life without death in our world. Only our living God can do this through His gracious actions. That's why nothing and no one can be compared to our Creator and Redeemer. Our God is above all creation. He is unique and He is sovereign. Rebellion and disobedience, which began in heaven with Satan and the third of the angels, were eventually transferred to the earth when Adam and Eve sinned. And so the great controversy between good and evil began here on earth. You see, having been cast out of heaven, Satan decided to destroy the happiness of Adam and Eve on earth and thereby cause grief in heaven. Ellen G. White, in the story of redemption, page 27, tells us that Satan imagined that if he could in any way beguile Adam and Eve to disobedience, God would make some provision whereby they might be pardoned and then himself and all the fallen angels would be in a fair way to share with them God's mercy. Fully aware of Satan's strategy, God warned Adam and Eve not to expose themselves to temptation. Here's what God tells the Adam and Eve. Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. And the Lord God commanded, uh, commanded man, saying, If every tree of the garden you may freely eat, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. This means that even when the world was still perfect and blameless, there were already clear restrictions for human beings to follow. I'm just so delighted that our God is a loving, forgiving, and merciful God. God did not leave humanity in their sin. Instead, God led a war against the powers of darkness and their commander, Satan, the devil. God put enmity between evil and humanity so that humans would, would not be enchanted and snared by evil, but would be able to say no while clinging to God for wisdom and strength. Our magnanimous and loving God brought a solution to the sin problem by sending the promised seed, Jesus Christ himself, as the savior of humankind. And so we read in John chapter 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John chapter 5, verses 24, it says, Most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death unto life. Sin not only brought complications, but ultimately it also brought death. However, Jesus overcame death by his perfect life of loving service and selfish sacrifice and willing obedience. This is why Paul tells us in Romans chapter 6, verses 20, 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This week... We will reflect on the fall of Adam and Eve, on how sin and death took over our world, and on how God planted a seed of hope for humanity even back in Eden. Byron, Sunday's lesson, deciding between conflicting statements. Unpack it, explain it. Uh, definitely. Statements and tension. So let's start reading uh, by reading Genesis 2, 16 and 17. Victor, you just read this. Yeah, go ahead. The Lord God commanded the man saying, 
From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. Now, it's pretty straightforward, right? I mean, there's not much room for interpretation. Okay, actually, there's no room for interpretation. It's straightforward and blunt. So let's read about the first transgression or sin of man in Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die, for God knows that in the day that you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Now, we've read this many times before. <clears throat> and in this simple, truncated little six verses, we have the entire fall. Mm-hmm. And it seems a little almost too concise. Well, first of all, just so we're clear, the serpent, you know God didn't make anything that was crafty, right? Other versions say right. subtle. We know that that was the one and only, the, the rebellious one from heaven, Lucifer. So, just so we're clear on this, and in these six verses, we see where Eve eats the the forbidden fruit defying God, but sometimes we need to look at the lesser light to expand on what the God-breathed scripture has given us. Amen. So, I want to read Ellen White, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 53. Satan was not to follow them with continual temptations. He could have access to them only at the forbidden tree. Should they attempt to investigate its nature, they would be exposed to his wiles. They were admonished to give careful heed to the warning which God had sent them and to be content with the instruction which he had been or seen fit to impart. Mm-hmm. So, that is the only part where Satan has access to, to the first couple. Right. And if they go there, they're walking on deadly ground. I'd like to read um, Ellen White, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 53, paragraph 4. Resting in the rich laden branches of the forbidden tree and regaling, another way of saying feasting, itself with the f- delicious fruit, It was an object to arrest the attention and delight the eye of the beholder. Thus in the garden of peace lurked the destroyer, watching for his prey. So he's there ready, right? And he's actually eating the fruit. And I actually wanted to mention this because I think Eve gets a bad rap Mm -hmm. when we actually look at all this, with the bigger, fuller picture. Mm -hmm. So I want to read um, one more from Patriarchs and Prophets. Page 53, paragraph 5. The angels had cautioned Eve to beware of separating herself from her husband while occupied on their daily labor in the garden. With him, she would be in less danger from temptation than if she were alone. But absorbed in her pleasing task, she unconsciously wandered from his side. On perceiving that she was alone, she felt an apprehension of danger but dismissed her fears, deciding that she had sufficient wisdom and strength to discern evil and to withstand it. Oh boy. We're going to come back to all of these points. So <clears throat> Satan's there in the guise of a serpent in the tree, waiting just for that moment, almost like a spider, for someone to get caught in the web, waiting for that moment for someone to come by. And Eve is pondering at that time, straying from her husband and suddenly realizes to herself, oh, I have sufficient wisdom. I can handle this all by myself. Now, in Spirit of Prophecy, in volume 1, page 35, Sister White says, now was, now was Satan's opportunity. 
He addressed her as though he was able to divine her thoughts. Yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Thus with the soft and pleasant words and with musical voice, he addressed the wondering Eve. She was startled to hear a serpent speak. He extolled her beauty and exceeding loveliness, which was not displeasing to Eve. But she was amazed, for she knew that to the serpent God had not given the power of speech. So now she comes across the serpent eating the fruit and speaking to her, possibly even deriving on her own that possibly the fruit gave him that power to speak. So I want to continue, and so we see all of this, and... Then we go to the story of redemption with Sister White. The tempter plucked the fruit and passed it to Eve. She took it in her hand. Now, said the tempter, you were prohib prohibited from even touching it lest you die. He told her that she would realize no more sense of evil and death in eating than in touching or handling the fruit. Eve was emboldened because she felt not the intimidation in, or immediate signs of God's displeasure. She thought the words of the tempter all wise and correct. She ate and was delighted with the fruit. It seemed delicious to her taste, and she imagined that she realized in herself the wonderful effects of the fruit. Now, we've covered many of these other things about how she felt exhilarated and how the, God was holding out on her, but what can we learn from all of this that we've just read? First of all, hostile ground. When we are in Satan's territory, we are much more susceptible to his influence. Eve was at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We are when we spend time in the world, conforming to it, listening to the worldly knowledge as opposed to God's knowledge. We put ourselves at a greater risk of being deceived by Satan. Number two is self-reliance. After wandering from Adam's side, Eve felt an apprehension of danger, but dismissed her fears, deciding that she had sufficient wisdom and strength to discern evil and to withstand it. Those words of death that any one of us has the power to resist the devil on our own is just plain foolishness. God is the only match for the devil. Our own, number three is our own perception and knowledge. When Eve saw the serpent eating the forbidden fruit, when the serpent spoke to her, because we know they don't speak, when she touched the forbidden fruit and did not die, what was her conclusion? God must be holding out on me. There must be something that God doesn't want me to have. And if she doubted it even a little, she doubted it enough. How often do we hold to theories of man rather than the word of God? Even in the church, the mark of the beast. Many people think that has nothing to do with worship, and yet it all revolves around worship. What day is the Sabbath? We see all kinds of things about that. How we should keep the Sabbath. Oh, we have a full range that's not even based on Scripture how to be a disciple. Let God's word and God's word alone, sola scriptura, be our only guide. And even if it doesn't make sense in our minds, it does to the alpha and omega of the universe. And number four, let us always remember that no matter how it looks, how we may justify or rationalize it, sin is rebellion against God's word. Eve felt exhilarated at first, entering a higher state of being. Sin can feel that way at first. But after the initial euphoria has worn off, we realize that we, uh, what, that we would have been far better off never knowing it, just like Adam and Eve. I see a lot of Christians today that don't take the word for what God's word for what it is. They say things like, God knows me. He knows my heart. And that's true. God knows every last thing about each one of us. But here's the question. Do you know God? 
Do you know God as well as he wants you to? Is it a burden for you to do his good pleasure and will? Or a pleasure for you on this earth? That really so that we can have that joy and salvation that may be complete in him and him alone. Thank you, Byron. Thank you, Byron. Statement of tension. Well, we're going to spend a little bit more time looking at the deception of Eve. And um, because this is really an example of the psychology of sin. And so we're going to take some time looking at that. And I'm going to, I'm not, I'm going to look at portions of Genesis 1 through 7 before we get into this. And starting with verse 4, first of all, he told Eve what? You won't surely die. You won't die. For God knows that in the day you eat thereof, your eyes will be opened and you shall be as gods. So first he says, you're not going to die. Then he, then he intimates that God is keeping something from her um, and that there's something special, special knowledge if, if she eats of the fruit. And she looks at it and she goes, ooh, this is good. And so she lets um, the desires, her desires take over. And then she gives it to her husband and he eats. And so we know that God had talked with them in the garden. Uh, Victor read that um, with in, in chapter 2 of Genesis, that he said, everything is open to you except, except this one tree, or these two trees. And so um, she knew that. She knew she wasn't even supposed to go near it. And as um, Byron said, she wasn't supposed to be separated from her husband either. So we have these, we we have this scenario here of, of Eve just getting a little too far away from where she was supposed to be. <clears throat> so let's look at these strategies that he used to, to mislead Eve. First, he generalized God's specific prohibition. Has God really said, and how many times do we hear that? I've, I've heard this so many times uh, through different people I've, I've studied with or, 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 or different pastors. Is that really what the Bible says? And so we really have to look seriously <clears throat> at this because, first of all, he brings about doubt. Is what you know, is, is, is this doubt um, true? So Eve uh, counterguarded that the pro prohibition was in regard to only that tree that if they were ever to eat from it that they would die so she came back at him with that then satan secondly he contradicts god's statement again so first of all he puts in doubt then he contradicts god's statement he discounted a thus saith the lord he asserted categorically you certainly, will not, you certainly will not die. We see that Satan did that with Christ, too, with, with his temptations. So Satan, first of all, will plant doubts. Then he'll throw in the lie. And so we see that he kind of has this two-step process for this, this forbidden fruit. So he kind of puts her also on this path, finally, Satan uh, accused God of de deliberately suppressing knowledge. And so many religions are seeking that secret knowledge. And for, for some reason, instead of just taking the Bible, the word of the Bible, and thus saith the Lord, we get into seeking something secret. I want to read to you from uh, the story of redemption. Satan would convey the idea that by eating the forbidden tree, Adam and Eve would receive a new and more noble kind of knowledge than they hitherto had attained. This has been the special work with great success ever since the fall. To lead men 
to pry into secrets of the Almighty and not to be satisfied with what God has revealed and not careful to obey that which he has commanded. So that's what Satan does. He, he, want, he, he makes us think that there's something more out there that we need to know. He would lead them to disobey God's commands and make them believe that they are entering into a wonderful world of knowledge. This is purely supposition and a miserable deception. They fail to understand what God has revealed and disregard his explicit commandments and aspire after wisdom, independent of God, and seek to understand that which he has been pleased to withhold from mortals. They are elated with their ideas of progression and charm, with their vain philosophy, but grope in midnight darkness relative to the true knowledge. They are learning and never coming to a knowledge of the truth. And so <clears throat> this is a trap that we as human beings can easily, easily fall into. So Eve's curiosity led her to the enchanted ground of Satan. There she was forced to decide whether to remain faithful to God, restraining his command, or to embrace Satan's seduct seductive allurements. Doubting God's word, she used her own senses and em the empirical method that a personal observation to decide between the two. So let's look at what she did. First, she looked at it from a di uh, dietary perspective. Was the tree good for food? And how many times do we have desires, be it food, and that one I can relate to, um, because, oh, well, it won't hurt this just this one time. I'll be better tomorrow. It won't hurt this just this one time. Secondly, <clears throat> from an aesthetic viewpoint, it was, it was beautiful to the eyes. Oh, well, this is, this, is, this is not so bad to watch. This is not so bad to look at until all of a sudden you're in, in way over your head. Third, from a logical analysis, the tree was desirable to make one wise. Hence, in her own mind, she certainly had good reason to heed the words of the serpent and to eat the forbidden fruit. Unfortunately, this is what she did. And it, it, it's sad because we can get into this business of being on Satan's ground and thinking that we've got it handled and we're in control. And he's had many, many more years at this than we have. And so he has, he has a way of, of sucking us into something before we even realize we're there. <clears throat> So we know that God has said, and 1 Thessalonians 5.21 is really important when we, we're looking at these concepts because it says, prove all things. Hold fast to that which is good. So we want to look at that which is good and not evil. <clears throat> so, but, the, but the tragic experiences of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden demonstrated that knowledge in and of itself can be very detrimental. There are some things that, need, that indeed are be, we're better off not knowing. <clears throat> and I'm going to read um, two quotes from her to, to round this out, which I think are very important. Holy angels often visited the garden and gave instruction to Adam and Eve concerning their employment and also taught them concerning the rebellion and the fall of Satan. So they knew that Satan was out there looking for them. The angels warned them, of Satan and cautioned them not to separate from each other's employment that they may be brought in contact with this fallen foe. The angels also enjoined upon them to follow closely the directions God had given them for in perfect obedience only were they safe. Then this fallen foe could have no power over them. Satan commenced his work with Eve to cause her to disobey. First she erred in wandering from her husband, next lingering at the forbidden tree, and next, listening to the voice of the tempter, and even daring to doubt what God had said. In the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. She thought, per, she thought that perhaps the Lord did not mean what he said, and venturing, she put forth her hand and took the fruit and ate it. It was pleasing to the eye and pleasant to the taste. 
Then she was jealous that God had withheld from them what was really good. And then finally, uh, mind, character, and personality tells us the knowledge which God did not want our first parents to have was a knowledge of guilt. And when they accepted the assertions of Satan, which was false disobedience and transgression, were introduced into our world. This disobedience to God, its express command, was the, be was the belief of Satan's lie, opened the floodgates of woe upon the world. Amen. Thank you so much, uh, Barbara. It, it is just amazing what happens when we allow ourselves to be in Satan's own domain. It's just amazing. It's yeah. just the way it is. Tuesday's lesson is, uh, is, really, um, is really a good lesson for us to, to review. And the title of Tuesday is, You Will Not Die. Oh, now that's the statement that, that we have in Genesis chapter 3, verses 4. And the Bible tells us in Genesis 3, 4, Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. Now this statement made by the devil to Eve contradicted God's explicit commandment in the most emphatic manner. In fact, the Hebrew expression actually says, you will positively not die. Don't ever question it. You're just not going to die. See, Satan challenged the truthfulness of God's word through an unconcealed lie. This is why Christ, in John chapter 8, 44, called the devil the father of lies. With this emphatic assertion, Satan put his own word above the word of God. And this is just so unbelievable. Unfortunately, throughout the centuries, we have seen a powerful manifestation of this lie in the common belief in the immortality of the soul. See, this notion that the soul is immortal is the basis of many ancient religions and philosophies. See, in ancient Egypt, it motivated this belief, motivated the mummification practices and the funerary architecture as seen in the pyramids. The pyramids were tombs. This theory also became one of the main pillars of Greek philosophy. For example, in the Republic of Plato, Socrates asks Glaucon, are you not aware that our soul is immortal and never perishes? In Plato's Phaedo, Socrates argued in a similar tone saying that the soul is immortal and imperishable and that our souls will exist in 80s. Unfortunately, these philosophical concepts helped shape much of the Western culture and post-apostolical Christianity's belief in the immortality of the soul. And where did, where did this start? In the Garden of Eden, with Satan himself. Today, the satanic theory of the natural immortality of the soul has grown and has persisted. It is everywhere. We see it expressed and promoted in books, in movies, and TV programs, where we are told that when we die, we simply pass into another conscious state. We see it proclaimed in many Christian pulpits, many devout Theologians throughout the centuries have held the belief that man is inherently immortal. Even science has gotten involved. There is a foundation in the United States trying to create technology that it claims will enable us to contact the dead whom they believe are still alive but exist as post-material persons, PMP. With this lie so prevalent, it's no surprise that this deception will play a crucial role in the final event of human history. Dr. Emil Brunner, a professor at the University of Zurich in 1954, declares 
The opinion that we men are immortal because our soul is of an indestructible divine essence is once and for all irreconcilable with the biblical view of God and man. He wrote that uh, in, his, it, uh, in the book he wrote, Eternal Hope, that is in pages 105 and 106. This is published in 1954 by Westminster Press, Philadelphia. The New Testament teaches that human beings, through their acceptance of Christ, may enjoy a foretaste of immortality in their spiritual experience in the present life. This is what the Bible says. John chapter 17 verses 3 tells us, And this is eternal life, that they may know you, Christ, God, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Eternal life, or immortality, is a gift of God's grace to those who have faith. See, the Apostle Paul tells us in Romans chapter 6, verses 8, Now if we died in Christ, we believe that we shall also live with Him. Romans chapter 8, verses 11 tells us, If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, in other words, if God's if, if Christ's, if, if God's Spirit dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to you, to your mortal bodies, through His Spirit who dwells in you. In contrast to immortality of the soul, the Bible teaches that the dead know nothing. So let's go to the Bible. Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verses 5 and 6 tells us that for the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing, and they have no more reward. For the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love, their hatred, and their envy have now perished. Nevermore will they have a share in anything done under the sun. Paul, if the dead were in a land of bliss, where the atmosphere is surcharged with love, how could people be in heaven as loveless beings? But the Bible also teaches that death is a land of oblivion. Psalm chapter 6 verses 5 tells us that in death there is no remembrance of you. Psalm 88 verses 12, the, uh, uh, in, in that psalm, the psalmist calls the grave the land of of forgetfulness. In Psalm 146 verses 3 and 4, the psalmist tells us, do not put your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, he's talking about us human beings, in whom there is no help. His spirit departs, he returns to his earth, in that very day his plans perish. You see, at death our thoughts perish. This renders a person incapable of adoring God and in, incapable of knowing anything here on earth. Psalm 115 verses 17 reminds us that the dead do not praise the Lord nor any that go down in silence. The Bible teaches that no one goes to his or her reward at death. David, King David I'm talking about, a man after God's own heart, said before he died, and we read this in 1 Kings chapter 2, verses 2, I go the way of all the earth. In other words, I'm going to die just like anybody else. But did David go to the place of his reward when he died? The Apostle Peter speaking a thousand years after King David's death, says in Acts chapter 2, verses 29, and 34, that David is, verse 29, both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us until this day. Then he adds in verse 34, David is not ascended into heaven. If David, David did not go to, to his place of reward at death, then no one gets to either hell, purgatory, of heaven. As a conclusion, 
to this, to this lesson, to this discussion and presentation. I want to read what the Apostle John tells us in John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29. This is for you and for me today. Do not marvel at this. For the hour is coming in which all who are in the grave will hear his voice. We're talking about, about Christ's voice. Verse 29. And come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. May God help us to adhere to what the word of the Lord says so as not to be deceived. Byron, sin brings about consequences. Oh boy. Adam and Eve experienced these. Please explain. Plenty of them. <laughs> so Wednesday, consequences of sin. Sin is a curse that brings terrible consequences. It starts off usually as something not that big, but well watered and nurtured. Sin can build and grow into the true ugliness that it is. It begins by separating us from God. Once that separation occurs, it opens the floodgates for everything else that flows. At first, the waters are steady and not overwhelming. As the floodgate continues to open, more and more of its true power of sin, it becomes to dominate until the floodgates are wide open and it's a raging torrent that streams through the gates. Sin destroys people, families, loved ones, relationships at every level. And finally, it destroys ourselves. And without God to conquer it in our lives, we are destined for a trail of destruction leading to death eternal. Nice, huh? Yep, that's sin. Let's look at 10 things that sin does in our lives. <clears throat> As we mentioned, sin, number one, sin breaks um, our relationship with God. And that broken relationship with even ourselves. We're supposed to love ourselves, right? Thus, Adam and Eve's nature was corrupted by the consequence of their sin. They lived with the consciousness of guilt and shame and with feelings of degradation and defeat. And Genesis 3, 7 says, Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together <clears throat> and made themselves loin coverings. Number two, sin made Adam and Eve afraid of God instead of permitting them to enjoy his presence. In the presence of God, we see too clearly exactly what we are when we're afflicted by sin. In Genesis 3.10, it says, He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And that's Adam speaking to God. Number three, Sin led Adam and Eve to blame others for their failures. Yeah, finger pointing. Thus they experienced a broken relationship with each other. Sin alienated them from one another. In Genesis 3, 12 and 13. And I love it because Adam blames God and Eve, whereas Eve just blames the serpent. Verse 12, the man said, the woman whom you, that's God, gave to me with or to be with me she gave me from the tree and i ate so it's god it's your fault and eve's whereas in verse 13 then the lord said to the lord god said to the woman what is this you have done and the woman said the serpent deceived me and i ate well at least she didn't blame the man <laughs> number four sin brought up um, brought death into the human family because Adam and Eve's relationship with their life giver was broken. There was not even a realization of what death was until that moment. In Genesis 3, verse um, 19, B, the second half of it, till you return to the ground because from it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. 
I remember reading it, I believe it was in Patriarchs and Prophets, even after they sinned, the air had changed. They saw the withering world around them and they knew what death truly was and what was waiting for them in the end. Number five, sin would make giving birth and raising children a painful experience. I don't know what it was like beforehand, but ask any woman today, it is not a joy. <laughs> Um, Genesis 3.16, to the woman, he said, that's God, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth, and pain you will bring forth children. Yet your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. Oh boy, and that part brings us into another six. Number six, sin would make marriage a place of fighting for dominance and supremacy instead of a loving, caring, emotional, and intimate relationship between a man and a woman. Remember, they were viewed as equals before sin. God took the rib out of Adam's side, and Ellen White writes it wasn't below or above so that they would know they were treated as equals. All of that changed after sin, and that, that was completely gone. If Adam's already finger pointing at his wife, can you imagine how much joy is down the road? Number seven, sin would make work a painful experience. Remember, their work was a pleasure before. Sweat and weariness from laboring to earn a living would become part of life. And we look at Genesis 3:18 and the first part of 19. Both thorns and thistles, it shall grow for you, because the earth is cursed as well. And you will eat from the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face, you will eat bread. In other words, you have to toil just to survive. Number eight, the sin of Adam and Eve resulted in harming their sense of good and in the loss of their ability to discern between good and evil. Now I want to read Genesis 3.22. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, and now he might stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. I want to point out one big distinction here. Adam practiced sin. God never practiced sin. God knows of it, but he doesn't partake in it. And that is the world of difference because once you partake of sin, sin is delusional. Number nine, sin broke Adam and Eve's relationship to nature. And as we read, the ground produced thorns and thistles. The ground was literally cursed. And we see in Romans 8, 22, the whole earth suffered that curse. Um, verse 22 reads, For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. Let's see, that was two or 4,000 years after sin originated. And the earth is still suffering. And number 10, sin brings the train wreck that follows. And what I mean by train wreck, all the wonderful things that it's brought into this world. Jealousy, hatred, violence, starting with Cain killing Abel. That's just in the first generation. Lamech and his wives, Ada and Zillah, polygamy. The consequences of sin even made it on the ark with Ham and later Canaan. We could go on about the abominations of the ancient world, but we, don't we have abominations today? We might not be sacrificing children in the fire, but there's plenty of evil in the world to go around right now. War, human trafficking, addiction on an epic level, drugs, pornography, various, I won't even go into it all, but both legal and illegal, oppression of the poor, Murder, once again, both legal and illegal, just to name a few. Violence galore, and it's only getting worse. Second Timothy 3, 1 through 5 reads, But realize this, that in the last days difficult times will come, for men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful and unholy, unloving and irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, 
lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. Avoid such men as these. There are so many ways that there are bad outcomes just from those five verses. Every act of sin leads us farther down the path that is against God, against our purpose for him in this world, against the only true joy and happiness that we will ever know in this world and the next. That's why it makes me glad to hear about the first gospel promise. <laughs> and am I delighted? Thank you, Byron. Am I delighted that we are going to, to really finish, finish this lesson Thursday with the first gospel promise? Barbara. That's right. God did not leave them hopeless when, when all, or us, for that matter, hopeless when this all, this, this all came down. Uh, Genesis 3.15 3, 15 and 21 said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise its, his heel. Unto Adam also and unto his wife did the Lord make coats of skin and clothe them. So what we see here that in the midst of all the struggles that they were going through after this happened, First of all, they had, to face, they had to face God, and then they realized that their lives were going to be changed forever and not for the better. So first of all, what God did was cursed the serpent um, with the word of messianic hope. He declared, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between my seed and her seed. And so we see that even though we, we've seen now we've had now that we're sitting on the other end of history, we can see how Satan had Christ put to death, but Christ still had the victory over this. And I'm firmly convicted that he will completely bruise the head of, of uh, Satan at, at the very end of time. This word enmity that's here implies not only long-lasting cosmic controversy between good and evil, but also a personal repulsion to sin, which been, has been implanted into us only by God's grace. And um, we desperately need that because by nature, we're completely fallen. We're slaves to sin. Uh, Ephesians, 1 and verses, Ephesians 2 verses 1 and 5 says, and you hath he quickened who are dead in trespasses and sins. Even when we were dead in sin, he quickened us together with Christ. So we see that, this, that, that Christ brings about a change in us. We're saved by his grace. Romans 6.20 says, For when ye were servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. However, the grace of Christ implants in every human life, creates in us enmity against Satan. And it is this enmity, a divine gift from Eden, that allows us to accept his saving grace. Ellen White says in the story of redemption, um, having to do with the, um, the, the, the sacrifice, the Lord next used the animal sacrifice to illustrate the messianic promise in 321, when Adam, according to God's special instructions, made an offering for sin, it was to him a most painful ceremony. His hand had to be raised to take the life. And in fact, all throughout the sacrificial system, the sinner is the one who had to take the life of the, um, the, the um, sacrificed animal, which God alone could give and make an offering for sin. They had to take that life that, that only God could give. It was the first time he had witnessed death. He looked upon the bleeding victim writhing in agonies and death. He was to look forward to, by faith, to the Son of God, whom the victim prefigured, who was to die for man's sacrifice. And this, was, this is really hard to do. Those of you who are in the health care as I grew up in healthcare, it's it's difficult to watch to, to watch people die, and we've even seen it many of us in our own families. 
Also, they would knew that they would eventually die because um, Genesis 3, um, 19 says um, that for dust thou art and dust thou will return. So Adam and Eve now have left the garden, but God didn't leave them naked or with their fig leaf coverings. He, um, in Genesis 3, 7, he said, and the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew they were naked and they had sewn fig leaves together for an apron, but God himself made tunics of skin for them and, and clothed them. Um, early writings tells us that sorrow filled heaven as it was realized that man was lost and that the world which God had created was to be filled with mortals doomed to misery, sickness, and death, and there was no way to escape the offender. The whole family of Adam must die, I saw the lovely Jesus and beheld the expression of sympathy and sorrow upon his countenance. Soon I saw him approach with the exceeding bright light which endorsed the Father. Said my accompanying angels, he is in close converse with the Father. When he came from the Father, he then made known to the angelic host that a way of escape had been made from lost man. He told them that he had been pleading with his father and had offered to give his life to a ransom to take the sentence of death upon himself, that though <clears throat> that through him man might be pardoned, that the merits of his blood and obedience to the law of God, they could have favor with God, and he brought into the beautiful garden to eat the, the, from the tree of life. So we see this. Um, and if you, you read on um, about the story, the angels were saddened, very, very saddened by this, and they wanted to even take Christ's place. But it was only Christ who could, whose sacrifice could um, no, uh, take care of, of the sins of the world. So <clears throat> he was the only one that was worthy. And we see in 2 Corinthians 5.21, he hath made him... To be sin for us who knew no sin, that he might be made righteous, um, in we, he might that might be made the righteousness of God in him. Hebrews nine twenty eight says, "So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and into them that look upon him shall appear the second time without sin until so, until salvation." In fact, it was our sin. It wasn't the cross that killed Christ. It was our sin that killed Christ. And that is, and it's, it's such a, it's so great that, that he has given his grace to us that we may also conquer. We've seen that, um, <clears throat> that same gift we see re represented in the story of Joshua, the high priest. And that's, you can read in Zechariah 3, 1 through 5. I'm going to just read the first two verses. And he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand. Then the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand out of the fire? So God is going to deal with Satan at the, at the appropriate time. But we do have hope, and I, I, the, there's, there's two verses um, in Revelation that really give us this same hope. And one is Revelation 7, 9. After this I beheld, and lo, a great mul multitude, which no man could count the number of all nations, kindreds, and peoples, and tongues, stood before the throne, and the Lamb of God clothed them with white robes, and palms in their hands. So when we have these, we have these, this promise that was given to Adam and Eve that we'll see when we're in, in, in heaven. In Revelation 3.12, him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall no more go out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is the new Jerusalem which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him a new name. And so we will be able to, when all is said and done, to 
go back to the garden. Amen. And Amen. what a joy that is. What a, what a promise. Thank you so much, Barbara. Thank you, Byron. Oh, it's been a, a great lesson. I really hope that you've enjoyed this lesson. I, I want to bring this to, to a conclusion by providing a few thoughts, maybe a little reflection. We know that through Adam and Eve's rebellious act, sin was introduced to this world. Ever since, every human being has been involved in the consequences of the first sin. Each child that is born is born into a sinful human family. Each child has inherited the weaknesses and perverted tendencies resulting from sin. Thus, each one of us are subject to death. Bottom line. I am just delighted that God in His mercy is in search of humanity. He's in search of you, in search of me. He wants to occupy your heart and my heart. And despite sin, He wants to bring hope and salvation to the problem of sin and death. If only you believe, have faith, invite Him, and accept. God loves us unconditionally and was willing to send His Son, our Creator, our Lord Jesus Christ, to this earth to die for us and to die on our behalf so that our relationship with God could be restored and we could be victorious in Christ. You and I can be victorious in Christ. Through Jesus Christ and through what He did for each one of us, we can be assured of salvation and eternal life. <coughs> Ellen G. White in Desire of Ages, pages 388, tells us that Christ became one flesh with us in order that we might become one spirit with Him. Let, let me repeat, this is profound. Christ became one flesh with us in order that we might become one spirit with Him. She goes on to say, it is by virtue of this union that we are to come forth from the grave. Not merely as a man manifestation of the power of Christ, but because through faith, his life has become ours. Those who see Christ in his true character and receive him into the heart have everlasting life. It is through the Spirit that Christ dwells in us, says Ellen White. And the Spirit of God received into the heart by faith is the beginning of life eternal. So is life eternal possible? Yes, as soon as Christ occupies your heart and has dominion over it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 to 58, Paul describes your final victory and my final victory in, in Christ. Let's read it. Verses 51 of chapter 15. Behold, I tell you a mystery, says Paul. We shall not all sleep. In other words, we will not all die. We shall not all sleep. But we shall all be changed. Verse 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. Verse 53. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. Verse 54. So in this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Verses 55. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? Verse 56 says, the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God 
who gave us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast. This is verse 58. Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord today. That's Paul's appeal to you and to me today. And so let me repeat it. My beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and let's thank the Lord for His graciousness and His love. Gracious Heavenly Father, I am so delighted that there is a way out of a sin and the condemnation of sin, which is death. I am just delighted, Father, that you loved us so much. You were so gracious that you gave us your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, our Creator, who came to this earth to live among us, die our eternal death, so that with Him and in Him, we could have eternal life. Father, open our eyes so we may see your glory and your beauty and your graciousness. Purify our hearts so we may receive your love and, we may and you may dwell within us. Engage our minds so we may understand the truth, Lord, and may learn more every day about you and your purpose for each one of us. Oh, Father, help us to die for self every day. Take our will, mold it into yours. And Lord, as you do so, may we embrace you eternally and live an eternal life that can be ours through you in us. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath.